All right, we're back from spring break, just one week until the next exam, and here we go with the Chapter 5 Homework 2 review. Uh, so this homework assignment was all about stoichiometry, a lot of different types of calculations involving chemical reactions. Uh, and looking at the, the results, the scores were a little bit lower this time. We averaged about 9.6 out of 12. We had been running at about 10 out of 12. Um, so the material is a little bit tougher. There might have been a little bit of uh, spring apathy thrown in there. So. Um, we do need to, to shore up some things. And most of the questions that I'll go over to are more of the conceptual variety. We seem to do pretty well with the straight up calculations, but then there's obviously some concepts that we want to understand that relate to these calculations, and that's where we're going to focus a lot of our time on this review. So the first question is about balancing chemical reactions, and it is purely conceptual. So we have a specific chemical reaction represented by the equation AA plus BB plus C goes to CC plus DD. So the lowercase letters are the coefficients and the uppercase letters are whatever chemical symbols they are, whether it's a you know atom or a molecule, um, element or compound. So we want to know in this question how many possible values are there for the quantity C over D? So that would be the ratio of these two coefficients C and D. Um, so the first thing here is that we're talking about a balanced equation, so that means the atoms on the left equal the atoms on the right. And remember that when we balance a chemical equation, conventionally we do it with the lowest whole numbers, but we can really use any combination of numbers that we want, as long as the number of atoms on each side is the same. That said, if we're talking about a ratio of two coefficients, that ratio is going to be invariant. So let's just put random coefficients in. So let's say the coefficients are 1, 2, 3, and 4. So let's say the balanced reaction has this form here. So in this case, lowercase c equals 3, lowercase d equals 4. So let's suppose that this is the correct way to balance the reaction. And that means the ratio of c over d equals 3 over 4. Now the question here is asking what, how many possible values are there for this ratio. So the coefficients, the individual coefficients a, b, c, and d can be whatever we want. Or not whatever we want, but they can, they can have infinite number of values. But the ratio, as I said, is going to be unchanged. So let's look at what happens if we double the coefficients. So let's double all the coefficients so we get 2a plus 4b goes to 6c plus 8d this is still a balanced reaction as long as we do the same thing to every coefficient as long as we scale each coefficient by the same amount the reaction will still be balanced it's not with the lowest whole numbers in this case but that's okay and if we look at the values here c equals 6 d equals 4 and the ratio c over d is 6 over 8, which is still 3 over 4. So no matter how we scale the coefficients, as long as the reaction is balanced, the ratio of any two coefficients is going to remain unchanged. So there's only one possible value for this ratio, C over D. Whatever it actually is, no matter how we change those coefficients, either scaling them up or scaling them down, the ratio will remain unchanged. All right, so that one just required a little bit of thought, and sometimes the best way to think about it is just to randomly assign values for the coefficients and see what happens. Okay. Now the rest of these have some more calculations uh, involved with them. So here we're talking about the reaction of N2 and H2 to produce NH3. We want to know how many moles of N2 will produce 59.6 grams of NH3 if sufficient H2 is present. All right, so the first thing to do in all of these problems is make sure we have a balanced chemical equation. We can't begin to proceed with the problem without that. So we have N2 plus H2 going to NH3. Now, it, we don't have to use whole number coefficients when we balance reactions, but it's often helpful to do that. It makes our life a little bit easier numerically. So if we put a 2 there and a 3 there, that should be balanced. N2 plus 3H2 going to 2 NH3s. We have two nitrogens on each side. We have six hydrogens on each side. So this is a form of the balanced chemical equation, but obviously we could have scaled the coefficients or had fractional coefficients if we wanted to, but this works out uh, the best with whole numbers here. And then we have to start and, and see what the question is asking us. We want to know how many moles of N2 will produce this. So we're looking for the moles of N2 that are involved. And we're producing 59.6 grams of NH3, and we're told that sufficient H2 is present. So this is another way of saying that H2 is the excess reagent, excess reactant. And remember, if we're looking at a problem here where um, we're only given the quantities for the product, 
we don't, we're not given quantities for two different reactions, we, we don't have to worry about limiting reactant here. So we're already being told in this problem that N2 is the limiting reactant, so that's what we're going to be finding here. We don't have to worry about figuring out whether nitrogen or hydrogen is the limiting reactant. So we're looking for the moles of N2 that are going to produce 59.6 grams of ammonia. So we have 59.6 grams of product being produced. And in a stoichiometry problem, we always want to get to moles first because all of these coefficients are in terms of moles. So we're going to use the molar mass of NH3 to convert that into moles. So the molar mass of NH3 is 17.03. So we're going to divide by that number to have grams cancel out. We now have moles of product. We want to figure out how many moles, sorry, how many moles of N2 would produce that. So we know that from the coefficients, there's a coefficient of 1 in front of N2 and a coefficient of 2 in front of NH3. So we want moles of NH3 to cancel, and we're forming one mole of N2. So that's how many moles of N2 are required to make that many, to make that much NH3. And then finally, the question asks, and that's where we're going to stop. So we have to keep in mind where the questions, what the question is asking us. So it's tempting to convert this back into grams, but we're looking for the number of moles here, so we stop. And so when we calculate this out, and I think this was one of those questions where you had the numbers could be a little bit variable. So you may not have had the exact same numbers here, but the process would have been the same, and you get 1.75 moles of NH3. All right, so this is a case where we didn't want to convert the last quantity into grams because we're asked for the moles of N2, so we stopped there. All right, so this was a mass to mole stoichiometry problem, so we have to start by converting into moles, and then we use the stoichiometric ratios, the coefficients, to convert from moles of one species into moles of another. All right, this next question is uh, very similar, and I forgot to put numbers in here, so let's invent a number here. Let's say we're combusting 6.47 grams of C4H10. So this is another question where you had variable inputs. It could be you know different numbers associated with this, but a series of steps to solve the problem would be the same. So we're saying combustion of 6.47 grams of C4H10 will yield how many grams of CO2? We're assuming 100% yield, so that means we're just calculating the theoretical yield, and we're told that we're just told the amount of one reactant, so we don't have to worry about limiting reactants or anything like that. So again, the first thing we have to do is write a balanced chemical equation, though, which we're not given directly in this problem. Combustion is one of the reactions that we should be familiar with. So in a combustion, we're taking some compound that has carbon, hydrogen, and or oxygen, and then we're adding it in the presence of O2, we're burning it, and the two products of a combustion reaction are always CO2 and water. So a combustion reaction will always have the same form. Something plus O2 makes CO2 and water. And now we have to just balance it by putting coefficients. So we put a coefficient of 4 in front of carbon dioxide to balance the carbons. We put a coefficient of 5 in front of hydrogen, in front of water, which balances hydrogen. And now we look at the number of oxygens that we've used. So we have 4 times 2 is 8, plus 5 is 13. So to balance O2, we put a 13 halves in front of here. Now when we're doing a stoichiometry problem, we don't necessarily need to have whole number coefficients. Um, it doesn't really matter if they're whole number or fractional. So we could stop here, or if we wanted to, we could balance this by with whole numbers by, by multiplying everything by 2. So taking this down here, we would get 2C4H10 plus 13O2 goes to 8CO2 plus 10 waters. So we could have changed the coefficients to be all whole numbers if we wanted to. It doesn't really matter um, for this type of problem. Um, but this is the more friendly form of the reaction that doesn't have any fractions in it. And now we're just having to, to solve the, the problem. So we're looking for how many grams of CO2 are going to be formed. So that's our sort of target amount here. We're starting with 6.47 grams of C4H10, which we call butane. And then the first thing to do, as I said, is convert that into moles. So anytime we're doing a stoichiometry problem, you want to get to moles first. So we have one mole of C4H10. The molar mass of C4H10, which I calculated by myself earlier, is 50. 8.12 grams per mole. So we divide by the molar mass to get from grams into moles. Now we're looking for the amount of CO2 that's forming, so we can use either of these two balanced equations. If we use the bottom one that has all whole numbers, it's going to be 
8 moles of CO2 forming for every 2 moles of C4H10. So for this question here, really, as long as we have the relative coefficients of C4H10 and CO2 correct, it doesn't matter if we balance the rest correctly or not. Um, but it's going to be a 4 to 1 or 8 to 2 ratio, CO2 to C4H10. This one, we're looking for the grams of CO2, so now we have to convert back into grams by using the molar mass of CO2. So that's going to be 44.02 grams of CO2 in one mole. That's just the molar mass of CO2. And so when we work out these few steps here, uh, I got, this seems high, um, 19.6 grams of CO2. Let me double check that number. It sounds higher than I would have expected. Maybe it is fine. No, uh, that's good. Okay, so 19.6 grams of CO2. Sorry, I didn't cut this out beforehand. Um, okay, so that's going to be the answer to this one. Uh, we don't enter in the units, so we would just enter in the number. We're doing it in Blackboard and um, you know, follow the directions for number of decimals and all that stuff. But the correct answer here for three significant figures is 19.6 grams. All right, so this is a pretty standard mass-to-mass -mass stoichiometry problem. The challenge in some of these is to produce the balanced reaction first, which we didn't give you here. So the first step was to then balance the combustion reaction. All right, now we're going to move on to some problems that deal with limiting reactants, and some of these have a little bit more of a conceptual flavor to them as well. So the first thing we should talk about is what does it mean to be the limiting reactant? So the limiting reactant is the one that gets consumed completely in the chemical reaction. It's going to limit how much product is formed. And then the, whatever other reactants there are, whether there's one or two other reactants, however many there are, those other reactants then will be called excess reactants, which means there's going to be some of them left over. So if we look at this problem here, we have 0.1 moles of SaO2, 0.2 moles of HF are combined, and we want to know which of these statements is false. So the first one, A, deals with what is a limiting reactant. So if we have SiO2 plus 4HF, so here we're given the balanced reaction, so we don't have to balance anything here. And we're starting with 0 0.10 moles of SiO2, 0 0.20 moles of HF. If we want to know which one is a limiting reactant, we have to then... There's a couple ways we can do this, but the way that I taught in class is to find the stoichiometric ratio, R. So the R for each of them is going to be the number of moles divided by the coefficient. So the coefficient for SiO2 is 1, so its stoichiometric ratio is just 0.1. And then for HF, we have 0 0.20 moles. The coefficient for HF, though, is a 4, and so we get 0 0.05. So that means that this is going to be the limiting reactant here because it has the smaller stoichiometric ratio. So that's, again, a fast way to figure out what the limiting reactant is. So this one is going to be true. HF is the limiting reactant. And then because HF is the limiting reactant, that means the other one, SiO2, is going to be the excess reactant, which means that some of it will be left over. So by virtue of HF being the limiting reactant, A and B are both true. Choice C asks, asks for the theoretical yield of SIF4 in terms of moles. So if we want to find out how much product can form, remember that when we calculate the moles of product that are forming, we have to start with the moles of limiting reactant. So we have 0 0.20 moles of HF is our limiting reactant. And then from the balanced chemical equation, we have one mole of SIF4 forming for every four moles of HF. So this is just the coefficients from the chemical reaction. One for SiF4, four for HF. So that means the theoretical yield is only 0 .050 moles. So this one is false, so that looks like it's going to be our answer. Let's verify then that the last two are true. Choice D, more HF would be needed to ensure that all the reactants are used up. This is also going to be true because HF is a limiting reactant. So if we wanted to consume all of the SiO2, we would have to add more HF to the mixture than we already have. So that one's going to be true, again, by virtue of HF being the limiting reactant. And then choice E asks for the theoretical yield of H2O. So the moles of H2O that can form, again, we start with our limiting reactant, HF. 
We have a coefficient of 2 in front of H2O. So 2 moles of H2O form for every 4 moles of HF that react. So that means our theoretical yield for H2O is 0 0.10 moles. So that one's also going to be true. Alright, so the only one that's incorrect is choice C. That's going to be the answer we pick. This one required a few simple calculations and also a little bit of conceptual knowledge about what it means to be a limiting reactant. So I'll review some of those topics if you need to. All right, moving on to the next one. This one is a straight up calculation. Um, and we, were, we, we say that calcium reacts with sulfur forming calcium sulfide. What is the theoretical yield that could be prepared from 2.75 grams of calcium and 2.50 grams of sulfur? So this is another question where the, the input numbers were variable, so you could have gotten different numbers um, in this problem as well. But first thing we have to do, just like any stoichiometry problem, is write the balanced chemical equation. Now for being a little bit pedantic here, something we'll learn later on is that sulfur actually exists as S8. So the most correct way to write this reaction would be to do this. That means we need 8 calciums and we're going to form 8 calcium sulfides. Whether you realize this or not, it's not important for this problem. So most of us probably just balance it like this. We just said calcium plus sulfur going to calcium sulfide. These look way different from each other, but it turns out that for a stoichiometry problem, it doesn't matter how you calculate or how you balance the reaction. So we could have balanced the reaction either way. So let's just use this one as the simpler one and the, the one that you're probably going to, most of you probably did because we don't realize at this point that sulfur exists as S8. That's something we won't talk, to learn until later. But we didn't tell you that in this problem because it doesn't matter how you balance the reaction. Either of those will give you the same answer. If you don't believe me, you can try both forms of the reaction. But we're looking for the theoretical yield of our product. Here's a a problem though where we need to first figure out limiting reactant because we're given the amounts of both reactants 2.75 grams of calcium 2.50 grams of sulfur so we have the mass amounts of each reactant we have to figure out which one is the limiting reactant before we start our calculation so the first thing we do for a limiting reactant problem is calculate the moles of each reactant so for moles of calcium we have 2.75 grams of calcium and we use its atomic mass from the periodic table, which is 40.08. And so we get 0 0.0686 moles of calcium. And then its stoichiometric ratio, R, is just that number divided by the coefficient, which is 1. If we use the second reaction here, we're going to use this form of the equation. Both of them have coefficients of 1, so the stoichiometric ratio is just equal to the number of moles, 0.686. We do the same thing for sulfur. We have 2.50 grams of sulfur. The atomic mass of sulfur from the periodic table is 32.07, so we divide by that number to calculate moles of sulfur. This time is 0 0.0779. And then the stoichiometric ratio then is going to be just that number divided by the coefficient, which is still 1. So this one is the smaller one, so this is going to be the limiting reactant. So our limiting reactant is calcium. So when we calculate the theoretical yield in grams for the product, we have to start with the amount of calcium. We already calculated the moles of calcium, so if we're looking for the grams of calcium sulfide that form, we have 0 0.0686 moles of our limiting reactant calcium. This form of the reaction, of the equation here, it's all one-to-one -one ratio, so we have one mole of calcium sulfide forming for every one mole of calcium that reacts. And then we want to calculate the grams of calcium sulfide, so we're going to use its molar mass, which is just the sum of the two atomic masses. So we have 72.15 grams of calcium sulfide for every one mole. And so what we get here is 4.95 grams of calcium sulfide. Okay, so when we're, when we're doing a problem like this where we're given amounts of two reactants, we have to 
first calculate which one is the limiting reactant, figure out which one is the limiting reactant. And then we can go through and do the stoichiometry calculation just like we normally would where we start with the limiting reactant. All right, the next two problems were ones where we probably did among the worst. And so these ones are a little bit more conceptual dealing with limiting reactants. So the circles below depict the reaction of AB2 and B2. So looking at this, we have these molecules here, which are one black and two orange, that's going to be AB2. These ones, which are two oranges, are going to be B2. So from those clues, we can say that the black spheres are A, and the orange ones are B. So we want to identify what each of these are. They're reacting, and they're forming a, a series of products over here. So the only product that is formed, the only new product that's present, is this one, which is one black and three oranges, or AB3. So the first thing we have to do is write a balanced reaction using these pictures and using this information. So we see that on our reactant side we have AB2 and B2. And then we're forming as a product AB3. And that's the only product that's formed, the only new thing that we see on the product side. Um, we notice that there's a little bit of B2 left over so we can say that B2 is probably a limiting reactant, but first let's balance the reaction before we get ahead of ourselves. So if we want to balance this reaction, um, we can put a one half there, and if we want to double this with, to get all whole number coefficients, we would get 2AB2 plus B2 goes to 2AB3. All right, so this is the balanced reaction for this picture, AB2 and B2 making AB3. We put a couple of coefficients in to balance it. So here it's asking if five moles of AB2 reacts with three moles of B2. How many moles of B2, if any, would remain unreacted? All right, so let's first calculate the stoichiometric ratio. So we have the molar amount for each reactant. We have to figure out which one is the limiting reactant. So the stoichiometric ratios are just going to be the moles divided by the coefficient. So stoichiometric ratio for AB2 is 2.5, 5 moles divided by the coefficient. And then for B2, the stoichiometric ratio is 3 moles divided by its coefficient, which is 1, which is 3. So this number is a little bit smaller. So AB2 is a limiting reactant, which means that there will be some B2 left over. So now we want to figure out how many moles of B2 are consumed. All right, so we know that all of the AB2 is going to be consumed. We're going to be left with some B2. So let's figure out how much of the B2 is going to actually react. We have five moles of AB2 reacting. That's our limiting reactant. From the balanced equation, we know that one mole of B2 is going to react with two moles of AB2. So we're going to react 2.5 moles of B2. And that means the moles of B2 in excess is three moles, which is what we're starting with. minus 2.5 moles, which is the, number, the amount that reacts, and that means 0 0.5 moles is going to be left over. So I think this was a multiple choice question, I didn't put all the choices here, but the correct answer would be 0 0.5 moles. So in this problem here, it's a pretty simple limiting reaction problem, but we have to first use the pictures to write the balanced reaction. And then we have to start with the moles of each and, and, and you know, use stoichiometric ratios to figure out limiting reactant and then calculate the moles of reactant that's consumed. So it's a lot of steps here, um, but don't let the picture sort of trip you up. We're just sort of in a convoluted way, in a sort of a more molecular picture, we're giving you the reactants and products. You still have to do the same set of steps, which is balancing the reaction and then going through and doing all the calculations. So this question then was very similar. Here we're talking about the reaction of A2 and B2. A2 is green. These are all of our A2s. That means B2 are the blue ones. And 
they react to form AB3. What is the limiting reactant and how many AB3 molecules can form? So let's write the balance reaction first. A2 plus B2 goes to AB3. If we put a 2 here and a 3 here, that should balance the reaction. Okay, so that's going to be the balanced reaction. And then we're starting with, here we have to look at the picture to figure out how many A2s and B2s we started with. Now here we're looking at, at the, the molecular level, but it really works the same whether we're talking about individual molecules or moles. So if we're starting out with A2, the initial amount of A2, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 A2s, moles or molecules. We have six molecules of A2 to start with, and then for B2 we have three, three blue ones. So we have, remember that chemical equations can be thought of in terms of individual molecules or moles that react with each other. So we can follow the same exact step, step, steps to find out the limiting reactant and do all the calculations. So we're gonna find a stoichiometric ratio for each one to figure out which one is the limiting reactant. So the stoichiometric ratio for A2, we have six molecules, the coefficient is one, so that's going to be a six, and the stoichiometric ratio for B2, I think there's one for B2 is going to be, we have three molecules and a coefficient of three, so that's going to be one. So this one's smaller, so that means B2 is the limiting reaction, that was part of the answer, I think this is also multiple choice where I was too lazy to follow the answer choices in. Um, but B2 is limiting reactant. And then the second part of the question is how many AB3 molecules can form? So here we, we again just have to do the calculation. So the molecules of AB3 that form, we start with the limiting reactant, which is B2. We have three molecules of B2. We use the stoichiometric ratio. So two molecules of AB3 are going to form for every three molecules of B2 that react. We're just using the coefficients again. So three times two thirds is just two. So two molecules of AB3 can form. And that would be the second part of the answer then. So again, I think this is a multiple choice. One of the answers would have said B2 is limiting reactant and two molecules of AB3 can form. Okay, so here we're using the picture then to tell us how many molecules or how many moles of each reactant we're starting with, and then from there we have to find the limiting reactant just like we've been doing. All right, the very last one I'm gonna go over is a, <coughs> a percent yield problem. So this is really just a stoichiometry problem with one additional step. We have to calculate the percent yield. So here we have calcium carbonate reacting with HCl to form CO2, calcium chloride, and water. And we're told that it's not balanced. We might have to add some coefficients. And we want to know what is the percent yield if 5.3 grams of calcium carbonate reacts with excess hydrochloric acid. So we know that we don't have to worry about finding a limiting reactant because we're already told that hydrochloric is excess. So that means this is our limiting reactant. And, we want to, and we're forming 2 grams of CO2 as the product. What's the percent yield? All right, so first let's balance the reaction. This one looks a little bit complicated, but it's really just an acid-base reaction where the salt that's the product of this reaction, calcium carbonate, ends up releasing CO2 in water. So this is kind of a weird looking acid-base reaction, but that's really what it is. Um, and so what we do here is calcium, we, we have one to one ratio, carbon, so all we have to do to balance this, it looks like, is we have two chlorines over here, so we put a two in front of HCl, and that should be all we need to do to balance it. So oxygen is now balanced, three on each side. Carbon is one on each side. Calcium is one on each side. Hydrogen has two. So looks a lot more complicated than it is, but just one coefficient of two in front of HCl is enough to balance this. Okay, we have the balanced reaction now, and as it turns out for this problem, we didn't even really need to know what that coefficient was. And then the next thing we have to do for a percent yield problem is calculate the theoretical yield. So if 5.35 grams of calcium carbonate is reacting, how much CO2 could possibly form? That's where we do the stoichiometry calculations to figure this out. So we're looking for the theoretical yield of CO2 in grams. So 
So we're starting with 5.35 grams of calcium carbonate. We have to convert that to moles first by using the molar mass. So the molar mass of calcium carbonate is about 100, 100.09. We can then use the molar ratios to find how many moles of carbon dioxide form. One mole of CO2 forms for every mole of calcium carbonate that reacts. And again, whether we balance the reaction correctly or not, we could pretty easily see that all of the carbon from calcium carbonate goes to CO2, so they must react in a one-to-one -one ratio. And then to find the grams of CO2, since we're given the grams of product that actually form, let's calculate the theoretical yield in grams. 44.02 grams of CO2 per mole. That's, again, the molar mass of CO2. So our theoretical yield here, I think it's 2.3 something, let me check. two point three five grams of CO2. So that's our theoretical yield. If we want to calculate the percent yield, that's going to be the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times one hundred. So the actual yield and the percent yield problem is typically going to be given to you if you're trying to find what the percent yield is. So 2.00 grams of CO2 is produced. That's the actual amount that was produced. The theoretical yield is what we calculate by figuring out how many, how much can form from the limiting reactant. So 2.35 grams is the maximum amount that can form. And we multiply that by 100, and what we get is about 85.0%. All right, this, so this reaction had an 85% yield, which means that 85% of the maximum amount of CO2 was produced. All right, that takes us to the end here. Um, again, we have an exam on this stuff coming up in just one, o just uh, about one week from now. So please review some of this material. Please ask me any questions if there's things that still aren't clear. Um, and uh, I will see you in class later today.